This week, we're back at the National Celtic Festival it in Port Arlington. Like that was such a long time ago. It does. And today we have a really, um, the only way to describe this, it's quite an exquisite experience. Mm. We have uh, an interview and several songs from Bush Gothic, who are Jenny M. Thomas on fiddle and vocals, Dan Witten on stand-up bass, and Chris Lewis on a uh, small drum kit and percussion and um just to set the scene so the room that we had was at the back of a place called the bendigo bank so it was quite a small room and we had any kind of community room and it had f- uh, fluorescent lights so we turn off the fluorescent lights because it leaves a, a hum on the on the microphones so we just had a small desk lamp in this bank back room <laughs> and three incredible players hot from a gig they had just finished on the main stage they packed up the gear lugged it across to the bank and set up it was exquisite it's a great word it, it was it was such a treat yeah so so that's what you've got coming up uh, a quick word as as ever to say thank you to everyone who's gone to our patreon page um patreon.com slash blarney pilgrims um, to donate and to help us cover the costs of this podcast and um yeah. your sound your we will, sound we'll talk to you a bit more about that um at the end but for now let's just get, get right into, into this this is bush gothic blow your winds hey oh roving i will go my two love is beautiful my my two love is young my true love is young Well, my true love is beautiful My true love is young And her eyes are like the diamonds bright And silvery, well, silvery was I told my boy So though she's far away She's taking a trip on a government ship Ten thousand miles away Blow you in
Welcome to the Blarney Pilgrims podcast. Thank, thank you, you so thank much you. for joining us. This is a, a real treat. Here we are in the Bendigo Bank at the National Celtic <laughs> Festival. <laughs> <laughs> we have the keys to the bank at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night. I mean, <laughs> doesn't look sus at all. <laughs> With one lamp on. So what was that song you just played? It was called 10,000 Miles Away. So that's a song that um, is considered to be a traditional Australian song, but I think it started off life in England and then came here along with the rest of us. So there's a load of stuff that I'm interested in, in talking to you about. And um, I guess we'll start with just the, the origins of of you three together playing together. Mm-hmm. That's right. Like when you think about that now, how does that, how do you characterize that? How did that happen? Well, I got an email from Jenny and um, I said, yes, I'll come and have a play. And then she said, <laughs> there's a gig. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was quite some time ago. Right. So that was, yeah. was it like 2012 or something? Uh, no, actually, it was 10 years ago. And we did a series of um, what we call Bush Band Saturday, mo- Saturday afternoon series, where every week I would get a different bunch of musicians, b- pretty much just the bravest people around to come and do Australian folk songs. Except and that, except that, was that before the gig at um, the. Darabin Feast, where we played it with Roy. It was before that. That oh, was okay. the very first thing we ever did. And oh, at so Bar 303 in Northcote. Yeah, so I just I wanted to um, have a band, and all I knew is it had to have drums. Um, and I'd, I'd worked with Chris before in Circus Oz. And so, um, and the instrumentation to me wasn't as important as the people. Yeah, to right. To be the right people. So you, you mentioned bush bands, right? And I think this is something we keep on coming back to. The bush band concept is something that just kind of lost on myself and Dominic because we're not we don't live in, we haven't lived in Australia for that long. What's your take on, or how would you define bush band music? Well, bush bush band. I came across bush bands in the seventies as a kid because I grew up in a left wing, small L liberal household, and there was as part of the folk revival in the seventies that included um, Australian trad folk songs particularly from the left wing perspective so there was lots of depression era songs union songs and there were bush dancers which were effectively a romantic ideal of a um, rural focused um, colonial social activity involving dancing in shearing sheds Uh, so there was work songs also Um, musicals Music halls. Well, actually, what I understood about it was for bush bands were a thing and that they were generally involved at playing at parties and uh, anti-nuclear demos. And, um, well, in the 70s. In the 70s. That, that <laughs> the, but yeah. I understood that idea of a kind of... Of a of a bush sensitivity, a bush sensibility and um, an agricultural social idea. So is it... Is it the Australian equivalent of that American folk revival? Is it kind of like it was, it, the same thing was happening maybe just at a different time? I think it's a little bit different. I don't think that there were like, uh, what do they call them, like um, picking sessions and stuff like that. A little bit, a little bit. For, well, I mean, da- it was a band for dancing, for dancing like a Kaylee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I yeah. suppose just the term bush is this romantic term for not in the city. Yeah. 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 But... Um, the bush band I knew when I was growing up was Monbolk Jam. What about you, Chris? What do you reckon a bush band is? I I, I know very little about bush bands. <laughs> um, and yeah. I, when was it, the first time you heard the term? Oh, bush actually, band? probably uh, probably in the early eighties. Uh. There was someone took me to a bush dance. Yeah. Oh, okay. And what was that like? It wasn't my thing. No, it's not my thing. Well, what was it like? So what? something that didn't think was their thing, what was it that you saw and you went, nah, that's not a problem. Well, the, I'd say for me it wasn't my thing. It was too formal. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I found, I found it too too formal, personally. Like cool dancers? Yeah, 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 yeah. But that, it was just, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's just my... Yeah. my own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'm the rogue were... in this band. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they were very formal. and some. I've heard these great stories of um, bands that were very early on in the colonial era of Australia where um, there were particular dances which were for the um, people who were born in England and, and who were free settlers. Um, so um, 
And then there was the um, bush dances, which were for the ex-convicts um, or, or the um, the um, so they were called and the people who were born in Australia. So there's this real distinction between currency born, which means the Australian currency, which is was a much lesser value than sterling, pound sterling. So you're either sterling or your currency. Uh, yeah. And there were different dances for the different strata of society, and. Um, had to go to the right one and there's even a story of one um i've only read it from one account but i reckon it's got to be true of one big hall where there was a band at each end and you had to you had to go to the right end <laughs> no crossing getting, there no crossing yeah. otherwise the bush no. police will come and get you Aye. the folk police, <laughs> <laughs> the folk police. <laughs> they're still around they're i, I know we it's, know yeah <laughs> So yeah, do, do, do you come into contact with the folk police a lot? In, we, uh, in, in they're the very you're silent. With? They're like the secret. They're like secret agents. They they tend not to. They they don't make themselves known, but you you somehow know they're there from the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> they're the ones who go when the when they see the drum kit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you yeah, know about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, I really know yeah. about this. I probably. <laughs> or the people yeah. who come up and say, "Now, tell me." Was that jazz that I could hear? <laughs> Was that some jazz? <laughs> you know, I, I once got accused of playing. I mean, I once got accused of playing um, jazz-like music oh, jazz <laughs> in an Irish, oh, jazz in an Irish pub. Jazz yeah. like. When I was when I was six, jazz-like. Oh, jazz-like. Jazz-like. Yes. And what um, were you? Attempting? We were playing. We were actually attempting. Uh, me and uh, Tony Murray, a guy I went to school with, were attempting a version of uh, Oblivious by Aztec Camera, a Scottish band. Uh-huh. Uh, f- with guitar and flute, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> yeah, obviously, we could have presumed. But you that. know, there's an F sharp minor that goes all the way up the neck, oh, and it, yeah, right. it's and there's a seventh in there, and it's oh. just you know it's pretty, pretty risky stuff. It's pretty yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so yeah, that's my claim to fame. There you go. Right. Yeah. So what so, were you into before? Getting down into the, this bush band, were each of you in different things? Different, like, is this your first? Obviously, yes. it's like your first. Style we were of all music. into quite different yeah. things. Um, so I came to this from um, uh, going through the whole classical um, system of um, I was a classical violist, who. But my my background, my family background, is very much folk music, playing guitars around a campfire, singing in church, and um, but I branched out and, and did Irish fiddle and. Scandinavian fiddle and then found uh, and then fell deeply in love with Indian music and then um, did that for as a for many years until I saw um, I saw bush bands playing at different festivals that I was performing at as a multicultural musician and I thought oh that's it was so masculine and I, I, I was just like three or four chords and wasn't I wasn't excited by it, yeah. so I thought it's time to do something else. So that's that was my journey. Yeah, and that was the moment when you said you started this band. Is this I started doing it as I started performing the songs as a soloist first. Yeah, mm. yeah. And and you know that, that I'm interested about the Scandinavian playing that you did as well because that is such a an amazing dynamic kind of stirring sound. Isn't that, it? That, it's yeah. incredible. Like, yeah. But it's, um, I don't have anything else to say about it. I just kind of wanted to share that. It's just that's uh, perfect. I read the first time I heard it. it. It was like, this is this is kind of why it's strong. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is anyway. strong. I've heard similar sounds from some very old English fiddle music. Mm-hmm. It's quite stark and um, stark. Yeah, yeah, and the in, and there's and there's been connections made with Indian and Scandinavian music too. Some of the they use um, some quarter tones, so the notes in between the notes that we usually hear, which are just full of flavour, and also it's a um, it's like a very tart apple. <laughs> right. And uh, the, um, yeah, so that that tartness with the sweetness it really gets you. Yeah. Is this a silly question to ask? Is that something you can demonstrate? Yes, now? I can. So a Scandinavian tune. So um, oh, it's a very out of tune violin. That's my demonstration. Um, so they're the sounds we would usually hear with fiddle. But um, if you put in some uh, little quarter, so quarter tones, the notes in between. some yeah. other sound and, <laughs> and that's a little bit related to um, Indian music how I would hear it anyway so 
somehow they all come together. Yeah. <laughs> So we've we've mentioned um, the, the word uh, colonialism quite a lot um, and colonial. So I, I'd really like to talk about that a bit more. But do you want to do a do you fancy doing another quick tune first or? Yeah, sure. Do you want to? I've tuned for Adeline. Yeah, fine. Which is um, which is which is not a traditional Australian folk song, but we've started to do it because um, because it has a all it has an Irish song in it. The old triangle, uh-huh. and I was really interested in what is folk music, and we've started to do some songs from the sort of fifties, and even a couple of one from the eighties, and um, just with the idea that folk music is um, just stories passed along, really. Yeah, right. And um, so, uh, so there's a song. This song, Adeline, was um, it's an alt J song, the English pop band. Yeah, yeah. And they were touring in Australia, and whilst they were touring here, they wrote this song, and it's all about a Tasmanian tiger who falls in love uh, with a woman as she's singing the old triangle, which is an Irish song, um, but oh. they can never be together. Um, sadly. What a great premise for a song. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and this was, and the old triangle is the song that they sung in their tour bus, bus as they um, as they toured around Australia. That's. I have actually. Um, I, I've been playing a version of the old triangle for my for my son and my daughter, and my oh. my, my son is perennially kind of. Anxious about Brendan Behan's state, you know, is he st- is he still in jail, Dad? What what did he do? Brendan Behan to end up in jail? Uh, no, 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 no. He's, he's fine. <laughs> he is five. You know, six. So he's, 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 he's six. Oh, so, well, perfect. So, you know. Perfect. Um, I don't know how much to tell him. When do you start talking about that stuff to kids? So there you go. It's like... Well, you know. here's a play about capital punishment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Darling. <laughs> well, so, you could sing along then, perhaps.
of the Royal amazing thank, thank you. you that was fantastic <laughs> so um so there there's a song written by an english band um in australia featuring an irish <laughs> featuring an irish song in, in, yeah. in the middle of it so um one of the things that i'm, I'm very interested in in talking about and i'm not very well equipped to talk about it because i haven't been here for very long but having moved to australia like a year and a half ago from the states um and thinking about um, the place of uh, the kinds of music that are played at this Celtic festival, for instance, right? In my head, I have an idea of um, Irish music as being in part identified by being um, uh, particularly songs uh, reacting to the experience of being colonized. And I find it really interesting to sort of try and... Um, figure out how that fits into uh, Australia, where the Irish become part of the colonization, right? As do the Scots, as do the English. And, mm. and I don't have a question, but it just, it strikes me as something really worth exploring and, and, and I don't know where to go with it. So. <laughs> I've, I've got a bit of an idea. Go on Because <laughs> it's something that uh, I, I thought about a lot before the... When when coming up with a title for our previous uh, our album that we've just released, which is called Beyond the Pale, and um, the reason I decided to call it that because um, in many respects, um, certainly when I started playing Australian music, um, to play our own folk music was considered to be a bit beyond the pale. It was just really daggy and considered to be um, uh, not at all a cool thing to do, uh, but also. Um, was try to look at beyond going beyond what it is to have pale skin in Australia and mm-hmm. um, what that means. But um, going back to the or- origins of the the um, phrase "beyond the pale," which came from the 14th century when the English did colonise Ireland and they built a really huge wooden paling fence around Dublin and um, and to be outside of this fence was to be beyond English civilization. So therefore, to be beyond the pale. And to be inside was to be <laughs> in it, and so just um, that was the reason for giving the title. But the deeper, um, I suppose, movement behind it was a real conviction that um, here in Australia um, we're, we're very, um, and rightly so, we're encouraged to be multicultural and encouraged to open up our our hearts and minds to to all cultures, which I know I've done, um, and um, in, in the, my music and also, you know, who you're living with and um, and around you. But the very um, – something um, that runs really true and deep is um, my my own background of um, Irish and Welsh heritage. And so um, I think that there's f- uh, something to be uh, said for not, not forgetting that and trying to understand where that all comes from. And uh, – then that leads into the whole idea of, uh, well, um, how did my family get here or how did a lot of Irish families get here and um, a lot of the time it was from persecution by the English, um, or, um, whether that's by extreme poverty or or by being sent here as a convict um, 
whether as a political prisoner or not. And so then you get a whole lot of people, Irish people here in Australia, and they're considered to be the you know the lowest of the low, and they've never had property, and they've um, they've always been downtrodden. And so they get here and finally, you know, they have a chance to grab some land and they do and they grab the land, but then they become the oppressors. Then mm. they start oppressing finally, you know, for them, oh, there's someone beneath me and it's the indigenous people. Um, but their desperation is, over, you know, in many times overrode any feelings of compassion and so they took that land. So that starts to get, in some ways it's so complex, but in other ways it's really simple. Mm. So with the idea that um, um, this land that we're living on is full of stories and um, Indigenous stories that have been going for so many, you know, since the Indigenous people will say since the beginning of time. So this is a way of... um, And Indigenous people will encourage us to tell our stories. So this is a way of just adding stories to to the land that we're living on. And um, uh, I think my personal conviction is that um, there's so much to break open about the time when when Irish came here and when the English came here um, and what happened with the indigenous people so let's you know talk about it and sing about it and um, and of course it's important of course all these stories are important and um, especially coming from um, a long history in Australia of the Irish being considered to be stupid and um they were they were second class citizens in many ways and they were considered to be you know peasants and um so just reclaiming that and got um in a way and um and saying well actually look at this beautiful tradition and look how um fabulously rich and intelligent and broad it is and uh, that's not talked about in australia very much at all Mm-hmm. So I can understand your confusion. <laughs> yeah, confusion and, and probably some of it's just in my head, you know, like trying it's to something figure out. to reconcile. Like you, it's that thought. Coming to some articulation of how I feel about it, as, I mean, you've, you've, you've clearly reached that point, right, where you're able to sort of articulate it. I'm still kind of like floundering around. Sort of I keep changing my it. mind. Though. I mean, <laughs> we're all so complex in a way. We all, we can contradict ourselves. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we, were you going to say something, Chris? Oh, it's it's an indirect thing. Recently, it's it's about uh, two people who I played with recently, whose thing was I found out Irish music, and they 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 were interesting people because one was half Filipino, but he he was half Filipino, half Irish. Um, he we did a gig. We did I did a jazz gig with this guy and him and a didge player an indigenous guy who was also half Irish and so just in terms of the sort of the where where the music's going I thought that was just a really interesting example of uh, I can I don't know the development of that music in this country and I thought oh right they know Irish music way more than I do Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) or even though I actually have some Irish heritage too yeah um, it was just just an interesting. Yeah, phenomenon. no, absolutely. Yeah, this uh, it was a virtuoso dig player that I played with, and a Filipino <laughs> guitar player, <laughs> half Filipino. Yeah, but it's you know just yeah. it's, 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 happy to bust yeah. out the tunes. Yeah, yeah well, the, yeah, the dig player he said, "I've got a few, I've got a few jigs." <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. He, he, <laughs> it's really interesting you called your album um, Beyond the Pale because I'm from Drogheda in Ireland which is within the pale uh-huh. and I always <laughs> not always but in, for the last while particularly thinking about this project and trying to reconnect with Irish music always felt that I am from the pale so it's almost that West Brit almost a bit of a shame attached to it that I don't understand real Ireland inverted commas uh-huh. and it, it's interesting you would use something like th- like a title like that looking back to Ireland for your own heritage because essentially it's the same reason I'm embarking on this podcast mm-hmm. it's to try and connect in a certain way because I am from the pale and I want to um, does it make sense to go beyond the pale yeah to educate it does. myself yeah. Yeah, yeah totally and actually when when we first met about a year and a half ago not long after I got here um, through a, an Australian friend and and he had said 
um, he said to me, oh, you have to meet this Irish person that lives in town. And he also said to Darren, oh, you've got to meet this Irish guy who's moving to town. And, and we were both a bit like, I was like, um, oh, I'm probably not as Irish as him. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I'm not, so, not as Irish Identical as thoughts just going, oh, this guy's going to be so Irish. I'm just going to be <laughs> <laughs> so, so there, there you go. That's, that's kind of, I think. If we could pause for a song, probably a good time. Um, if you had one or a tune, yeah. um, and he's gone with cattle. Yeah. yeah, is this going okay for you? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to add something. Yeah, please yeah. do. Um, yeah, yeah. Just on the. It's Dan, to, by the way. Just, uh, just for anyone uh, just listening. Yeah. In terms of the idea of post-colonialism, yeah. because from an academic perspective now, there's something really interesting in terms of. So I used to describe us often as uh, postmodern bush music, mm -hmm. but I quite enjoy po postmodern or postcolonial um, Australian folk because there's actually, at least in art, postcolonial perspectives do in fact play just with the prism of your own understanding. So the idea that to even recognise your blinkers and your privilege or mm -hmm. your understanding your education whatever is a, is a way to start an idea of taking perspectives of others so uh, you know this in this country it's you know as most parts of the commonwealth i guess you can see that it's a tiramisu of different pe people you know and there's a huge number of um, migration stories and even within the uh you know the exponentially longer history of um, indigenous peoples of Australia there's amazing migration stories so you know just understanding how connection to land and story and connection to the past y how you might sit in a perspective is, is just that you know that's kind of a massive thing but it's really um, it's quite I mean it's hugely humbling um, but it's also really really interesting and it can be as it is a lot at at happening at the moment in visual art incredibly playful there's humor and there's a lot of generosity often and anger and listening and talking so all of that form of communication mm. anyway <laughs> that was just a splurge splurge no, no. Really, yeah no it makes sense absolutely yeah. anyway uh, time for a chain yeah it's a good splurge i was actually going to say something after that which was something about like um i, I guess um it's I guess figuring it out is challenging, I guess, yeah. for me. I, I'm wondering if you find it like a personal challenge to have to, uh, like if you don't try and tackle the stuff for yourself in your own head and, and figure out where you stand in it. I, well, it ties into what we spoke about with the toxic masculinity on the way, well, over the last while, and we we'll probably will we'll get into that. After, in, in the, after the next <laughs> song. But it's the, <laughs> same, <laughs> it's the same space. It's, I think... Am I right in saying that it's the same space? It's about having starting conversations. It's about how you can tackle it head on, engage everyone in some way. Like we don't, I don't definitely don't have any answers for it, but I'm, I want to listen and talk and yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting that you've found this form. I mean, what, uh, I, I do suspect that um, writing, uh, arranging this music and having this band is very much me working out my identity. And where I, because I didn't feel like I fitted into folk festivals, I couldn't see myself represented anywhere up on stage, certainly not in bush bands. Yeah. So it was just a way of forging that out, going, oh, this is, this is just making your own, <laughs> which is what Australia is very much, uh, in a way, mm -hmm. making your own identity. And if you don't like the, um, well, the sort of sporty barbecue renovation culture, well, hey, go and do your own podcast. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right, well, let's have another number and then we can unpack all of that. <laughs> Post-colonial toxic masculinity. <laughs> 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 Saturday night in Port
Jenny, the last thing you mentioned before that tune was forging your own way in the folk scene. What was that like? Uh, what was the process? And sometimes it's uh, it's very hard to do something if there's if you don't have a mentor or mm -hmm. someone that you can go. Oh, look what they're doing! I'd I'd like to do something just like that. So I I, I really looked to overseas for um, folk movements in. Um, in, in England a lot and um, for inspiration and in many ways it's really it's it's wonderful to have an artistic project where you can see a whole lot of material in front of you that is ripe and ready for exploration and that's really exciting and great yeah. um, and the the flip side of it is that um, you're always sort of creating and in, inventing it seems a little like in a bubble <laughs> and there's always been that real um, real opposites like that in that we get great support from um say you know abc um he'll go ooh, that's an australian colonial history they go let's hear more of that and then um <laughs> and then other people who as soon as you hear, say the sentence australian folk music that they their eyes glaze over or that they just start walking away because they don't they're <laughs> they have certain expectations about what that is and the expectation is that your socks will be very long and you have a bushy beard and that you'll be um, singing 17 verses sort of shouting at you um, and that's with, with a lager phone with a lager phone which is how it has been on stage but it's not really how, how it is you know in the sessions and in the lounge rooms and in around the campfires it's much more subtle than that so what were the um, the inspirations that you were drawn on from England and other places uh, yeah. Well, I who were, um, the, who were the singers that were the singers was yeah. um, someone who was the very last podcast we did with, which is a singer called Jim Moray, and he's an English folk singer. And, and I actually I heard him on an Australian radio program, and he was a young English man singing English folk songs. And I thought, wow, look there you go, that makes sense. I thought, why doesn't someone do that with Australian folk songs? Because at that time, people were doing a lot of. American songs and um, that's pretty much it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in Australia <laughs> and Irish songs 
lots of other yeah. songs. Um, so, um, but apart from that, um, my uh, the on thanks and uh, oh, the yeah, yeah, and the winter absolutely. set, yeah, yeah. That are really um, did some great. So any or any played with them too, didn't you? Didn't you play at their festival? Or? Yeah, they invited us to come and, and play at uh, their festival, which was um, quite wonderful. Yeah. Uh, that was uh-huh. wonderful to do. And in Australia, um, pretty much anybody who, or any artist, whether it be a visual artist or a, a movie director or a dancer who would go just have conviction and say, no, this is, I really like doing this and, um, and I'm going to keep doing it. That's how, where I get my inspiration from. Yeah. So one other area that I wanted to touch on with you since you, you know, you've You've explored so, so, um, so deeply the area of folk music. Um, I have a couple of young kids, and I was teaching them one night. Uh, I, w- I was singing the wee Cooper of Fife. I don't know if you know that no, Scottish song. No. There was a wee Cooper who lived in Fife. Nickety, nackety, noo, noo, noo. <laughs> and he would get himself a wife. Hey, Wally, Wally, he ho, John Dougal, a hen, go, rush a tee, roo, roo, roo. And the kids loved that, those mm. nickety, nackety, noo, noo, noos. But of course, then yeah. I sort of thought, okay, yeah, I used to know that. I think I learned that song at school. So I went and looked it up. And it turns out the second verse is, you know, she wouldn't eat cook and she wouldn't eat stew, nickety, nackety, noo, noo, noo. Oh, no. The third verse, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't go well. So, yeah. Um, and so he puts a sheepskin over her because she's of a better class of, uh, uh, she's a better class of woman than he is of man. Um, and then he beats her with a stick. And by the fifth verse, she's cooking and stewing away as, oh. as expected, mm-hmm. right? So, so. Nickety, nickety, nickety. nickety. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of got me thinking about, it got me thinking about um, ideas of masculinity in folk songs. And, it, and, and I'm going on a bit here, but I'll tell you this other story. So the other thing that happened around the same time was that um, I used to have a Burns night in Seattle. And just after the 2016 election in the states we had burns night and my two friends were doing the toast to the lassies and the reply um they're both women and they they chose to recite a transcript of the uh, account that uh, donald trump gave of uh, molesting women oh. and they re- did it as a recitation huh. and it was absolutely heart-stopping and it's kind of uh horribleness and it and we we ended up having a very long discussion about why are we even celebrating Robert Burns you know and mm-hmm. what is that about <laughs> um so those two things got me kind of wondering about what do you do with uh old material folk songs uh that have material in them and it, it extends to anything really it's, it mm-hmm. extends yeah. to Irish folk mm-hmm. myths which I started trying to read my kids and it's like and then he slaughtered five it's like, Jesus <laughs> it's worse than the Bible well, it's, it's, <laughs> the, it's <laughs> the folk tradition and that, uh, so the, that's open and for for changing and uh, as to whatever times that you're in yeah so I think it's perfect for it and we're all capable of taking in so much subtlety that sometimes just a word or two changed. Maybe 